Hey everybody, it's Erin Taylor and Kim. This is our learner-led lecture focusing on the shoulder. I hope you all enjoy. Our PICO question was, is the empty can test an appropriate test to use for baseball players to access supraspinatus muscle injury? And our reference is noted below. Here's a synopsis of our article. There was strict inclusion criteria in patient exclusion criteria involved history of previous so shoulder surgery or upper extremity fracture. There was 152 subjects examined overall and 50 met the criteria for the surgery. The examination of the shoulder was performed by two examiners and that included the empty can test. And here is a video of the empty can test. also known as the supraspinatus muscle test. The examiner resists, resists abduction with the arm elevated to 90 and pushes gently on the shoulder. If the patient gives way, there is a positive test. The data collected was filed separately from the patient's file after completing the examination, so the orthopedic surgeon had no access to, and the orthopedic surgeon had no access to the original data when completing the surgical data collection form. The average wait for the between the examination and the surgery was 23 months, so there was no bias that was from the orthopedic surgeon. An arthroscopy was used to find the true pathology and all, exam all patients were examined. And here is a video of the arthroscopy. Arthroscopic rotator cuff repair is a minimal invasive procedure used to treat injuries in rotator cuff tendons. In this procedure, small incisions are made in the shoulder. A small instrument equipped with a camera and light called an arthroscope is inserted into one of the incisions the surgeon uses this device for image guidance during the procedure. Other small instruments are then inserted to remove the damaged tissue. Source of irritation, such as bone spurs on the acromion, is identified and removed. If there is no tear, the treatment may stop here and the surgical procedure is called shoulder debridement. In case of tear, Sutures will be used to tighten the tendon back to the bone. To do this, small holes are drilled into the bone of the humerus. Small suture anchors with threads are then inserted into the holes. The threads are attached to the tendon and pulled tightly to hold the tendon to the bone. After the procedure, the arm is placed in a sling. Physical therapy. Um, after the arthroscopy was completed on all patients, they were separated into two groups. The first group was a group that would be treated by conservative treatment or decompression, which was the first part of the video. And the second group required a tendon repair. And the statistics that we found on the separating each of the groups, finding tendonitis or partial tear, finding full thickness tear, finding large massive tear are included below. The conclusion of the article came to the empty can test in isolation does not make a significant change to any of the following until, unless it is a large, massive rotator cuff tear. The Pedro score was an 8 out of 11, and the CEBM level was 4 out of 6. In my practice, I will continue to use the empty can test because of its high specificity and sensitivity for massive rotator cuff tears, but I will use it in conjunction with other Special, so, shoulder special test to rule in or rule out a rotator cuff pathology. And more or updated research should be performed on the validity of the empty can test since this article is over 12 years old. The validity of the study was the patients did not state, the participants of the study did not state whether any of the subjects were baseball players and the patients were not randomly selected to participate in the study. An MRI was not performed, which would be the gold standard, 
And for blinded comparison, the surgeon did not have access to the original data collection forms when completing the surgical data collection forms. For the therapy study, our PICO question was comparing the effectiveness of the body blade versus the traditional resistance training program to, each, to increase strength in overhead athletes. And below is our citation in case you need to reference our article. Right now, we're going to show um, a quick video on how the body blade works. It's a really good video just saying like the effects and the purpose of it. Although the study we use does not actually use the body blade, they incorporate multi-directional movements with their bands instead. Hello, my name is Bruce Hymanson. I'm a physical therapist and I've been practicing since 1977. In 1991, I created Body Blade for my shoulder patients and my spinal patients, and I did this to create a better environment for their healing, for their flexibility, for their range of motion, and to strengthen and rehabilitate their body. What I did was I took the power of vibration and inertia. I put those two forces together to create an oscillating device that would rapidly contract the muscles in your body first to go very deep in the core, the smallest multiplicities muscles in the spine that layer all the way down the spine, building out into the core muscles, into the back muscles, the shoulders, the hips, and the legs. What we did was we found that using vibration and inertia, use Newton's laws of inertia to create the body in an environment that makes the human body the exercise machine. So just a synopsis of our article, as you can see, there was um, a very strict patient inclusion and exclusion criteria. The independent variable was a six-week strength training intervention that used therabands. Group A used a conventional unidirectional movement pattern um, of shoulder flexion and abduction, and Group B also used shoulder flexion and abduction and incorporated the figure eight and the infinity symbol. The dependent variable was a one rep max that was used to assess the shoulder flexion and abduction. This was performed by all participants, and all participants were randomized and double-blinded. For the conventional strength training, um, these pictures are right from the article. So on the left, they used abduction with TheraBand, and they only did strict abduction, no other movement, um, and performed three sets of 10. And then on the right, they prefer they perform shoulder flexion with a TheraBand and also perform three sets of 10. For the whole straight training, um, on the left, they did the shoulder abduction again and did three sets of 10. And for the first set of 10, the first five of 10, they did the figure eight. And then the rest of the set, uh, <laughs> the six through 10 was the infinity sign. And then on the right, they have shoulder flexion performing three sets of 10. Also, the first five was using the figure eight and the second set of five, or the second five was using the infinity sign. In conclusion, um, this study used lower extremity athletes instead of overhead athletes like we had preferred. And the results were found to be significant in helping increase strength for the variables that we were looking for. The therapy interventions that were shown in the pictures could easily be performed in any athletic training setting because their bands are easy to find and most common in all athletic training settings. The better strength training outcomes may be achieved by incorporating multi-directional figure eight and the infinity sign and the figure score was seven out of 11 and CEBM level was four out of six. For our modality study, we looked at uh, the use of diathermy, and our PICO question was that in overhead athletes, does the use of diathermy increase function and decrease pain for rotator cuff tendinopathy compared to corticosteroid injections? You can see um, kind of how we laid out our PICO there and our reference at the bottom of the screen here. Just a synopsis of this article, um, the patients that were included uh, were both male and female um, over the age of 18 and had shoulder pain that lasted at least three months. There was strict exclusion criteria for this, as you can see here in the list on the left, and even more criteria that wasn't included on our PowerPoint here. 
also you can note that with 204 participants starting um, this study, the exclusion criteria narrowed that down to only 92 participants. So more than half of the participants were cut out uh, due to exclusion criteria. Patients were randomly allocated into their treatment group, and all of the patients were tested using an MRI as a gold standard. The patients in the diathermy treatment group received three, uh, yeah, three treatments a week for four weeks for a total of 12 treatments, while the corticosteroid injection group had three injection treatments and one injection was given every two weeks. Um, in this situation, obviously, both the patients and the clinicians were aware of the treatment being given. The only person who was blinded to this study was the person performing baseline and follow-up studies. Now, in conclusion, our um, study kind of showed that both diathermy and the corticosteroid injections produce similar results and are both effective. Um, because of this, diathermy looks to be um, like an effective option for a non-invasive alternative um, to corticosteroid injections since it produces similar results. Um, Follow-up of this, sir, uh, this study, 92 of the participants for the corticosteroid intervention group, uh, two were lost to follow-up, one was lost to intervention error, and the other was lost um, because they just discontinued the study, while the diathermy intervention group lost six participants to follow-up. Uh, the Pedro score for this study was a 10 out of 11, and the CEBM level of evidence was a 3 out of 6, the randomized control trial. Uh, here on the right, you can see a picture of the local microwave diathermy. Uh, we're trying to find a video, but since um, diathermy is kind of becoming obsolete, it was hard for us to find a video of this actually um, working or being used. But on the left here, uh, we'll show you a quick video of the shoulder injections uh, for corticosteroid. Let me get to the right. Time to show you. The needle has passed just below the acromion into the subacromial space. The steroid should flow easily into the subacromial space. If there is much resistance, the needle should be redirected to avoid injecting the steroid into the tendon itself. Complications involved in receiving. All right, if you guys have any questions, you can see our contact information there or just, you know, shoot us a text or whatnot. And for all of our uh, CEBM levels of evidence, we use the scale in our textbook on page 103 if you guys wanted to reference that. And if you're watching this before Thanksgiving, then we hope that you guys have a happy Thanksgiving. And if not, have a Merry Christmas. See you guys later.